The following podcast is a presentation of Project Entertainment Network. Your call is very important to us. Please stay on the line and we will transfer you to the next available representative. Ah, Napoleon. How are your endeavors in 1995 going, hmm? Ugh, terrible. And why, pray tell, is that? I'm trying to get tickets for Oingo Boingo's farewell tour happening this year on Halloween at Universal Amphitheater, but it's only January and I don't think they even announced it yet. First Duran Duran, and now this? Well, yeah. I want to catch all the shows I missed the first time 1995 came around. You've got to be the only person who, when sent back in time to the 90s, devotes their time towards getting tickets to see 80s bands. Ah, I like to see them after they've had time to cultivate and develop like a fine wine. You know, besides, if I saw them in the 80s, I'd be stuck in a stadium with a bunch of teenagers, which is just... Well, if you'd be good enough, might I ask that you devote just an infinitesimal drop of your boundless attention towards tonight's podcast. Ugh, who's the freak of the week? An author by the name of Tone Milazzo. Tone Milazzo? Now, why does that name sound familiar? He's quite the San Diego fixture, and you've drunkenly humiliated yourself in front of him a number of times. Oh, jeez. Oh, jeez, indeed. However, in this case, that works to our advantage. You see, Malazzo has inside information on a device called the Faith Machine. The Faith Machine, sir? Yes, an ingenious little device cooked up by the Russian Psychometrics program. He's not another Soviet vampire, is he, sir? No, he's more of an Italian persuasion. Oh, phew. Uh, we're good with the Italians, right? Uh, more or less. I'm counting on his low opinion of you to set him at ease. Allow him to let his guard down enough to where he'll tell us everything we need to know about that delightful faith machine. I'm on it, sir. You can count on me. I can count on you to be a bumbling imbecile. Yes, which on this occasion is precisely what we need. Don't be scared, Al, but it looks like you just wandered straight into U-Mind Country. That's U-Mind, short for Unaffiliated Mind Games, and you ain't never gonna be the same again. Brace yourself. It's time for Red Hot Truth Injection. Oh yeah! That's right, bitch. We're rounding up the sheeple and shaking them awake. You mind too damn bad. We're gonna set fire to the wool over your eyes. Feel the burn, baby. Hot we're toppling the lies of the lamestream media, one by one. Woo-wee! Watch them bad boys fall. Hey, Universe A, this is Universe B calling, and we're going to tear you a new one. You mind? Hey, everybody. We are here tonight with Tone Malazzo. Hey, Tone. How are you? Hi there. Hi. How are you doing, Napoleon? I am doing good. Now, I've I've met you uh, before. Uh, is it okay to talk about kind of how we met? Oh, sure. Yeah. So, yeah. So, we, we basically met that uh, me and your wife pranked you one day at a party. <laughs> <laughs> so. Yeah, so she she uh, was saying that you you were kind of frustrated that, and and it's really the bane of any artist that you don't get a lot of recognition that people don't know who you are and stuff like that. So I went inside and took some video of you when you were standing talking to some people and just kind of said in the background, "Oh my God, it's Tone Malazzo. <laughs> He's here. Pinch me." And then tagged you and it put it up on my Instagram, and then you kind of came out to the balcony. So showing it to your wife, <laughs> and yeah, was, was yeah. that disappointing? <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, nah, I. It's nice to be seen. We didn't mean it to <laughs> be mean. At least proved I'm still visible. <laughs> yeah, we were just kind of having fun with you. So, but yeah, and uh, so we've done some stuff since then. Um, now you you were at Comic Fest actually. 
Mm-hmm. And um, uh, one of the founders, actually. Yeah, you are one of the founders. That's pretty yeah. amazing. I, I worked as first as volunteer coord, uh, yeah, volunteer coordinator, and then I moved on to programming. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then it was it was getting to be a lot of time, so yeah. I, I scaled it back. Yeah, but, yeah. So very cool. So. As one of the founders of Comic Fest, um, you've you've kind of shaped the way it's developed over the years. And uh... Uh, well, I don't know about that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a founding member of Comic Fest. I'm not the founder. I didn't have a whole lot of executive sway. Uh, so <laughs> take so, that with a grain of salt. <laughs> no, with with a grain of salt. But yeah, um, now we we participated on a panel at Comic Fest uh, last year, and we actually did uh, some role playing. Which is is really kind of you being an author, um, is kind of like live action authoring. Oh, so yeah, yeah it's <laughs> authoring improv, I guess. Mm-hmm. And um, just with all the work that you do with world building that we're going to talk about in your books, um, I guess that seems like a, a natural fit for you. And is mm-hmm. that something that you've always been pretty passionate about? Oh yeah, I've been gaming since uh, first edition AD and D. Oh wow. Um, actually, no, I take that back. Champions, the superhero game, was the first game I ever had. Okay. Uh, I didn't get a chance to play that because uh, back then it was the community was very small. And when you're you know, a 13-year-old, you're not getting a whole lot of uh, things going on. Uh, I didn't have a lot of friends who were willing to play that game. So I made a lot of characters for Champions. Yeah. Uh, and then I had to move on to Dungeons & Dragons because that's where the players were. Mm-hmm. Um, since then, you have know, sort of... I gravitate towards systems which really encourage player creativity mm-hmm. as far as the characters go. So, you know, Champions, it has its flaws, but if you have a vision, you can make it happen in Champions. And this, then I moved on to GURPS, and now Fate is my preferred game. That was the, the system that we played at Comic Fest. Yeah. Fate Accelerated. Yes. Um, it was a yeah. lot of fun. So, it's it's really interesting. Um, and uh, your your works are very strong world building kind of works. You really just create a whole universe and all the laws of that universe within your stories. Um, now, even though you're not uh, a comics author, you are. It, it is very evident in your work that you maybe have a little bit of a background that you sort of dipped your toe into that universe. Um, when did you start having kind of an affinity for comics? Oh, that goes back even further than the role-playing games. Uh, my first memory of comics was uh, being poor, uh, mm-hmm. waiting with my mom as she goes through the thrift store, finding clothes, and they'd have like the the nickel bin of comics underneath the the table there. So I remember getting Justice Society of America, Legion of Superheroes, some Avengers comics. Um, I always... I always like the team book. I like the team dynamic. Yeah. I, and you, you see that in my latest novel where it's an ensemble cast. And that's essentially a superhero story, too. It's just they're also spies. Yes. And we are going to definitely get into that. That's uh, I was lucky enough to where uh, the two books that we're going to be talking about today, uh, which are Picking Up the Ghost and Faith Machine, you actually uh, gifted to me. We, we did kind of mm-hmm. a book exchange. I gave you my comic book and you gave me your mm-hmm. novels. And uh, so, yeah, and th- those are really fascinating uh, pieces of work, I guess. So, uh, yeah, it's uh, I I really enjoyed them. They were I, I think I read them both in the same night, or may- maybe a little bit the next morning. But yeah, there was oh. uh, yeah very. very <laughs> I I also stay up for extreme periods of time. So. Uh. But, <laughs> So, but yeah, uh, just really fa- fascinating read. And um, I want to talk about picking up the ghost uh, mm-hmm. with, starting off. Uh, and that really takes us to this sort of withering city of St. Jude in the Mississippi. Mm-hmm. And we meet a young man named Sink Williams, who uh, really at the start of the book gets some, what for most people would be very bad news. And uh, I, I think you're probably an expert at your elevator pitch for this book at this point. So I, I will let you do that. <laughs> uh, well, it's been a while since I pitched this one because it's been published for a while. Let's see. Mm-hmm. It was, uh, the pitch was, it's a story about a 14-year-old boy mm-hmm. um, trying to, uh, 14-year-old boy living in a town that's dying on the Mississippi. Mm-hmm. And he's learning to find the magic so he can get in touch with his dead father. Right. Yes, so he gets the news that his father is dead, and but he hasn't really ever met his father. His father's not really been part of his life in the story, mm-hmm. 
And uh, so he he's able to get in touch with uh, people who are able to sort of work within that shadow realm who kind of uh, are able to get in touch with the other. So he actually uh, is in touch with a ghost as well, mm -hmm. which is a very interesting plot line. And I, there, there's, it's such a fascinating book to me. It's got elements of Southern Gothic. It's got elements of magic realism. You've got spirits, voodoo, uh, which it seems like it would be dark. And yet uh, a lot of times there, there's like really a thread of humor that goes through it. It's uh, dark humor sometimes, but mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and, and it's a really excellent piece. Uh, and I don't want to give too much away because uh, mm -hmm. it, it really is one of those plots that you, you really want to see it evolve and little by little mm -hmm. things reveal themselves that you might not have suspected. Um, but I, it, it made me wonder when I was reading it, how do you prepare for something like that? Did you visit Mississippi? Uh, no, but, mm. uh, there is a, lots of urban decay websites out there, mm. particularly, so it's called St. Jude, but it's actually East St. Louis. Okay. And, um, in particular for the main set piece there, the, the, uh, meatpacking plant. Mm hmm incredibly well documented every detail i have in there except for like one other piece for a graffiti is from this uh, website where somebody climbed into the place through the ceiling because the ceiling had collapsed and there was a tree growing out of it right. um and uh um beyond that the, the rest of the city it's a the city itself is a shame it was the example of a company town uh, mm -hmm. i think the primary uh it was mostly about being on the river and transportation. And when the the mineral gathering, the mining, uh, died off, the company just abandoned the town. And the only people left there are the people who couldn't afford to leave. Uh, originally, I wanted to, I knew I wanted to have elements of a ghost story, and I wanted to set it in something that was going to be a ghost town. Uh, the original idea was going to be Detroit. Okay. But a friend of mine who uh, read a book about the decline of the American education system, pointed me to a book that really covered, hammered on, I wish I remember the title of the book, but really hammered on East St. Louis instead. It's, got a little, it's a little bit less done to death than Detroit is. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's where that set piece came from. Uh, you know, Google uh, Maps helps a lot, too. They, you know, you can get, you know, not maps so much, but street view, you can get a real, real sense for how things look. When you went up to the coroner's, at first, I thought like the corner in Chicago was going to be this big Gothic building and everything like that, and it's just a boring beige <laughs> uh, office uh, off the side of the road there. So. Yeah. Wow, that's really interesting. Um, so, so you you rely on uh, like a lot of ex urban explorer sites and things like that, sort of, and so you just sort of absorb these visuals, and the world evolves inside of your head. It's, so. I kind of see creativity as a crock pot. Mm -hmm. Just keep putting stuff in, and it's going to stew, and it's going to create its own juices. The difference is you can take stuff out. Yeah. You can't do that with a crock pot. Uh, but um, it's, yeah, a lot of research. So I, uh, I knew I was going to do, I, I had my location. Um, I knew I wanted to do, actually, I should go back a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, originally, I started off like a list of things I was tired of seeing in a fantasy novel. Ah, uh, okay. So an orphan with a destiny, uh, has the magic mentor who leads them to the magic sword, etc. It's basically the the King Arthur essentials, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. I saw, I saw those tropes a lot. And first, I made a list of those. Like, I'm tired of these. I'm going to set the world on fire with my list on my live journal, and I'm going to teach them all. Like, oh, I'm just going to be another asshole with a list. So I, instead, I turned that into manifesto for the book. So I took each of those tropes and inverted them. So Sink is not an orphan. He does have a family. His father's missing. Uh, he doesn't have a destiny. He's not a fighter type. He ends up being a shaman. Uh, instead of gaining something, he actually loses something over the course of the story. So uh, that was the genesis of it. And then uh, going to the magic system uh, on the list of things mm -hmm. was the magic system is almost always some sort of Eurocentric type of magic right. system. I want to do something different. So I did a lot of research on West African voodoo, and that's the magic system you see there. Yes. Um, the loas and the way he interacts with spirits and such. And I was really curious about that because the, it is very well researched. Um, did you meet with a Bokor or a Kalata at all? Or? Again, San Diego, we got, we got the, the uh, Latin America type. Mm -hmm. And this is the West African type. And I yeah. didn't find anybody to consult with there. You know, there's reading through the history of it, though, you can see there's like a change that happens to that religion 
and I, I blame the slave trade, right? It's yeah, it's actually early. It's a happy religion in Africa, and then it's sort of the lower all split into two aspects when we get to the Caribbean, right? Mm-hmm. A light side and a dark side. Um, and I wanted to sort of pop over that and try and bring back to the original source. Yeah, where it's it's really just more more about nature and the the bonds that all mm-hmm. humanity shares and. Yeah, and I, I think that was done really effectively. Um, it's there's there's a lot of research and a lot of um, just really fascinating aspects that go into it that uh, you were able to just put in there. Um, and one of the things that I really like is that the story of Sink doesn't end with this book. It actually there's the Ginger Jar, which is part of an anthology through uh, Running Wild Press uh, mm-hmm. that also features Sink. And, uh, yeah, I'd like to revisit them a few more times. Uh, yeah, I was hoping you would. <laughs> canonic- so. Canonically, he is in the same universe as the Faith Machine. Mm-hmm. Uh, I have a short story that I wrote which ha- explains where uh, the second act villain, the shapeshifter, he has that magic screwdriver which ends mm-hmm. up in Sing's hand. Yes. So that magic screwdriver is uh, Project Dead Blind crossed paths with it just before then. Mm-hmm. In fact, uh, yeah. In fact, now that comes back to me, the shapeshifter was a member of that team of psychics. So, oh, very cool. So then we should talk about the Faith Machine, which is the other book that I was able to get from you. Um, and now that one is very interesting. Uh, that takes a lot of uh, you know psychic kind of. You you actually talk a lot about the the Russian psychometrics program, um, mm-hmm. which it features heavily in that, and uh, which was a real program. That was going on. Uh, we we deal with Soviet vampires over here from time to time, <laughs> uh, but it, it was a real project going on where the Russians were trying to weaponize psychic potential, basically. Which I wonder if they did. I don't okay, know. so here, here's here's my yeah. here's my thoughts on it. Mm-hmm. Um, it starts with the book, yeah, um, Psychic Warfare Behind the Iron Curtain, mm-hmm. right, and it's written by two Americans who went over there and the Russians just sort of shared everything they had, right? Well, most of that information was before the Soviet Union. It was like programs under the czar yeah. and left for that. Well, why would they share that information with us, right, so mm-hmm. confidently? Maybe they were trying to convince the American industrial uh, industry complex that this program was happening and they had to pursue it as well. And then they had to get contracts from the government millions, billions of dollars towards these programs, which are ultimately fruitless. I suspect that the Russians actually gave us a poison pill with that. Oh. And they weren't up to anything at all. And they just conned us into spending a lot of money on research that was a dead end. Yeah. But that doesn't go in the book because the book it's real. <laughs> yes, yes. And now in the book there there are people who are able to uh, you know, har- harness psychic energy and predictably as what would happen in the real world of uh, that they harness that energy for the benefit of certain organizations. Mm-hmm. So yeah, it's all based on. Uh, again, I did my research. I read a lot of book about mm-hmm. you know the the uh, spy organizations and culturally how they are, and that gets reflected in in uh, the different factions that I created that are various psychics. So uh, North Korea, brutal, willing to do anything. They're willing to take psychic brains out of their heads and put them in, into uh, freeze them and put them, make them weapons. Uh, China has been closed down a long time. Now they're playing catch up. So that's what was going on with that B plot right there. Yeah. Um, the Soviets, uh, they were doing fine. Uh, but then they had a, in the nineties when everything came crashing down, they had a big setback and they lost a lot of assets. Yeah. So it all really reflects. And then in America, we have lots of spy agencies who don't know what each other are doing and they end up stepping in each other's toes. So it all reflects the real world. Yeah, uh, and I want and I, I I wanted to treat this whole like scene of psychic espionage as secret, even the spies. Mm-hmm. Or that was I didn't want to have computers involved because espionage these days is mostly about munching data. Right. And I wanted to kind of get it back to boots on the ground, talking to people, car chases, that sort of stuff, that Cold War feel to it. Yeah. Yeah, I I thought it was really effective in that way. Um, now. Let's talk about the faith machine itself, which is kind of the focal point of the book. Mm -hmm. Uh, Now, there there is actually, um, I I don't know that there's a faith machine, but there are, there was paperwork published for something called the Serpan device, which was actually an energy bank, like an Oregon energy bank 
that could take mm-hmm. living energy. And if you were injured, it could put it into you or it could take it out of someone else and put it into someone. Um, and the faith machine works on kind of a similar principle that I, I guess I'll let you explain, but not mm-hmm. using energy like just living energy so much as using faith, faith, the, mm-hmm. the energy created by faith. So the idea being that the Soviets wanted to weaponize religion against mm-hmm. the practice, practices of, wit, of religion, rather. So uh, I kind of use Jim Jones as a model there. Yeah. Uh, and the idea being you give this machine, which allows you to pull in that faith, pull in that prayer went from your congregation and gives you information in exchange for it. You're able to actually see the future. You're able to see the you know, this remote viewing, all that stuff with that energy. And you just put it in the hands of the most dangerous religious people in the world and see what happens. Yeah. yeah. So, which is which is very interesting because uh, under the, the communist regime, that there was no religion. And so that, mm-hmm. that might have been like kind of playing into that, like, well, we don't want this to be turned against us. So we, mm-hmm. we're just going to get rid of that and mm-hmm. we're going to use everybody else. Well, the Russians still had the, the Russian Orthodox Church was yes. still there and still very much influential, even during the height of the Soviet Union. Mm-hmm. It was their enemy amongst them. Yeah. That's true. So very, very interesting. Um, now, tell me a little bit about the process that went into creating this universe. So obviously you're doing your research about the, the psychometrics program. Um, what else were you looking into to sort of evolve this world? Um, so the politics of the psychic, uh, sorry, the, the spy world. Yeah. Um, I did, I read every published book I could find on psychic espionage. It really, actually, I should say it started with Ron Johnson's The Ministeric Goats. Oh yeah. Okay. <laughs> Fabulous book. Yeah. Um, and hilarious. And, and the thought of a, what if this is, these programs were still going on, mm-hmm. which maybe, I don't know. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the, the problem with this, We've even, uh, Duke University used to have a, a PhD program in um, parapsychology. Mm-hmm. It was taken seriously at one point. Is is the science, did the science come short, or is the science still have some more work to do? I don't know. Um, and, you know, science, the scientific process being what it is, sometimes things fall out of favor and research doesn't get done. Right. Um, anyway, uh, so uh, building on that, sort of drawing forward to the future, um, started thinking about, um, as I'm laying out the ideas that I want, and I'm, of course, I'm still pulling from comic books, so I've got the ensemble cast, who is a, essentially a superhero team. Mm-hmm. Um, I know you've said before that they're kind of the X-Men in the X-Files. That's, yeah, that's the elevator pitch for the book. Right. So, so. Yeah, I forget where I came up with the idea that, um, that the... The psychic powers are tied to mental disorders. Mm-hmm. It's probably because that's just a theme of my book. Like in, in the, picking up the ghost, uh, Sink is schizotopal, right? Which is a light form of schizophrenia, and that and that's probably where it came from. I carried over that idea. So um, as I was reaching shamanism for that, I realized that the behaviors we associate with shamanism are also the behaviors we associate with people with the various schizoid uh, conditions. Mm-hmm. You know, they incline towards magic thinking. They see spirits, they interact with them, they have a whole set of rules to deal with them, um, and then how can I make that new for, because I don't want to hit that same notes, right, I don't want to, um, shaman spice, that's, that's, right. that's right. crazy talk, right, uh, <laughs> actually, it can't be crazy talk, I can't say that, uh, but, um, but, uh, so then, matching up conditions with disorders, I remember now where I came up with the idea, okay. I forget the guy's <laughs> name, uh, he had acquired savant syndrome. Mm-hmm. Uh, this guy who dove off into a pool. As a, I'm still in the research phase, and it was a TV show called like Extraordinary Minds. Right? Mm-hmm. So he dove head first into a pool, hit his head on the bottom of the pool, was in a coma for three days. When he came out, he had um, savant ability for music. He just started making music, and he had <sighs> no inclination, no talent with it, whatever beforehand. Just started grinding out music. Wow! So that whole idea of a superpower with a liability because he's got synesthesia, he's got migraines, he can't concentrate. So there's kind of a trade-off there. And that's what the, the idea for that. So that became a defining factor of the whole genre of um, psychics who um, it's, not, it's a blessing and a curse. Mm-hmm. 
which is sort of like the well, the Marvel superhero thing, particularly the X Men. Oh right, yeah. yeah. So, I think uh, like a lot of people in our peer group, uh, the X Men was hugely influential for us mm -hmm. growing up. I th I think uh, it speaks to anybody who doesn't really fit into that perceived societal unit and which is as you get older you realize it's kind of ridiculous that there is no normal person there is no <laughs> categorically <laughs> normal it's every group that you go to that has their own normal but uh yeah growing up and being in the high school kind of predicament you just are just like <laughs> oh, wait, i i don't work in this realm there's got to be some other group of people who i belong with and and the mm -hmm. x-men was this great hope that we could uh, I think I think everybody when they were a certain age was like oh do I have mutant powers I, I hope <laughs> yes how, I, many, how many times did I fantasize that I had claws oh absolutely <laughs> absolutely I remember how, how the X-Men get re, gets respun like Stan Lee originally mm -hmm. it was a metaphor for race yeah uh, Grant Morrison in the 90s made it a metaphor for generations mm -hmm. and now um Jonathan Hickman, who's writing it now, is doing a fantastic job of salvaging the property from uh, obscurity almost. Yeah. Uh, it's more like um, empowerment. Mm -hmm. How this is like, you know, we are the minority, but we're going to all work together and we're going to actually make something happen. Yeah. Yeah. And it's 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 really like an exciting uh, storyline. And, and, and I love how you incorporate that sort of uh, mutant element into mm -hmm. uh, Faith Machine. Um, when we're talking about a blessing and a curse, um, your work is so unique, but then it's, it's also not really genre specific. And, uh, I know when I've queried things, that's always the letter that you get back is like, well, this is almost young adult, but then you have this happening and this is almost sci-fi, but you have this and, mm -hmm. and you're kind of like, well, <laughs> I, I don't. And they're like, well, we don't know how to market it because we, we market romance, we market sci-fi, we market young adult. And if you don't fit into a, a neat category, you become kind of a messy property for them to pick up and too big of a risk. Um, when you were querying, um, what were some of the struggles that you came across? Uh, my query experience was less interesting because it was sheer volume and uh, I didn't get a lot of <laughs> I think I got a total of like 150 rejections from agents mm -hmm. uh, and no feedback. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah. I don't know. Yeah, I hear people get feedback from their rejections. So I yeah. don't know what it is I'm doing that uh, I don't get feedback on rejections, period. Huh. Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> I it's wish just... I had some more to tell you. I will tell you that, yes, uh, being, I mean, I prefer to stay out of, uh, you know, these, these genre labels, mm -hmm. but it probably is a liability commercially. Yeah, um, you you do occasionally see like a sci-fi or a fantasy book that really breaks the rules. Um, I don't know what it takes yeah. to uh, get attention when you're doing that. Yeah. yeah. Now, do you, do you have an agent that uh, sends out your queries for you, or? No, I have an agent briefly. Yeah. Um, she also exhausted all of her contacts and, and said, "Well, can't help you." <laughs> so, <laughs> but. Here's what came out of that. So, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, you know, the magic phrase is standalone novel with serious potential. Yes. So she had me outline two more books uh, that were supposed to come out of that. So she could make it part of the package that she pitches. So now I have no, I have no agent, but I have these two outlines with content in it. Um, you know, it's just structure of content. And a friend of mine who read, who pre-read the book had suggested that I make a role playing game based on the setting. Mm -hmm. So I've got, the novel, and then two outline novels full of characters and settings that I start assembling into a document that's going to be a role-playing game. And then I, I strongly recommend putting the basically what is the series Bible. Have you heard of that expression for TV yeah. shows? Mm -hmm. I really recommend doing this when you're doing world building. So I put everything in there and then the organization of it. So I realized I had slang for psychics, cards, um, and then the person in charge, directly in charge of them is a player. And then his boss is the dealer, and that's all I had. And then I realized, well, I can keep expanding this. So the dealer works for a table. That's the organization yeah. uh, that ma maintains them. Tables are part of a house, which is a national. So there's the American house, the Chinese house, etc. And then the entire psychic espionage scene, scene is called the strip. So okay. something, that's an idea that I, I wouldn't have thought of because without, without this organization process. Yeah, um, yeah. You know, you find these little holes. 
people. So when you talk about your organization process, when you start a series, um, are you working from an outline? Uh, how are you doing? Ultimately. Ultimately? I'm a, I, I am a heavy outliner. Yeah. First, it just winds up being spitball mm -hmm. on pieces of paper. And eventually, they, they start, you see themes developing and those ideas that you're getting. And some grow out, some cluster. Um, but I like to, before I actually start writing prose, I like to have a full outline done. So that's one page per scene. Mm -hmm. And the page will usually consist to a half page to a full page of bullet points. Yeah. So that could be, um, I definitely need to know, you know, obviously things like where they are and who's in the scene. But how does the scene move the plot along? And how does the scene show something about character? I try and hit one of each of those. Don't overdo it, especially that second one. <laughs> Just one of each per scene. And each of my scenes is like four to five pages. So they're pretty short. So, hmm. uh, so uh, uh, like for the, the page machine, I had 77 pages of notes then. And I was just ready to go. Like uh, this stuff had been stewing in my head so long that getting my thousand words a day. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you couldn't wait to get it out. Yeah. <laughs> so that's, that's awesome when that happens. That's really good. So and honestly, like, but I, I, I'd written two scenes that were missing. Mm. You know, my outline was so thorough. And then uh, through the editorial process, the only thing that changed was some things got moved around a little bit, mm -hmm. but that was about it. Very yeah, cool. It was. It almost came out fully formed. Yeah, just because you came in prepared like that. So yeah. I'm a slow cooker. No, that that that's, that's just... everybody's got their own process to to get things to the final point. So yeah. the thing that like strikes me is like the Phil K. Dick method, where you just get high on amphetamines and write for three solid days. Yeah, I don't understand <laughs> that method at all. <laughs> so yeah, it's that's that's pretty interesting. <laughs> But uh, um, that that was uh, now I I didn't get high on amphetamines, but I would just be like so amped up. But I remember uh, like starting in junior high, having concepts for like a storyline, and just like staying up for three days, just like ah, writing and that kind of thing, and drawing and having all these sketches and things like that. So, uh, I want to ask you actually, like, mm -hmm. what's drawn you to Dadaism? Ah, uh, you know, what, you know how you were talking about that you don't like the tropes that you see. Um, I, I hated that whenever I would talk to, uh, whenever I'd go to like a writer's conference or like any kind of a workshop or something, they'd be like, every story has already been told. There's only, there's the hero cycle and there's this and there, and I'd be like, I, I get what you're saying. Like for mm -hmm. something to be perceivable to people, it has to be a relatable experience. It has to be something that we can understand the progression of. So it has to, you know, follow a certain course of events. What I love about datalism is uh and and really surrealism in general is, is the fact that like people are like it has to have a beginning a middle and an end it's like well mm -hmm. not necessarily it, it can just like uh the book naked lunch um which is a, a great cronberg movie but it, the, the book in and of itself is so fascinating because those chapters are just uh, and that's phil uh not philip k dick i'm sorry william s burroughs um the chapters they have no specific order. They're just vignettes and you can read them in any order that you want. Um, and they're just, they're, they're kind of telling, they're, they're really just experiential. You're, you're just being mm -hmm. plunged into this world, into this experience. And there's no hero saga. There's no necessarily no cycle, no, nothing like, uh, oh, here's the climactic shift. It's just, here's an experience that you can be part of. Would you like to come on <laughs> in? And I think for me, that's what I think is so exciting about mm -hmm. that style of writing. <laughs> yeah. I read your comic just shortly after I yeah. watched a video by uh, PBA, PBS idea channel about the, the theme of the, ch the video was why is Japan so weird? Yeah. And it was the, the gist of it was when a culture comes out of a period of fascism, mm -hmm. it swings towards the surreal. Yes. And the same thing happened in Spain. Yeah, it after did. After their, their fascist dictator collapsed. That's where you get Dada as an Adam. Mm -hmm. And then in Japan, you got Mario. But uh, <laughs> both, both equally weird. Yes. <laughs> so I yes. think you're ahead of the curve there on that. So, yeah, that, that for me is just, uh, it, it's what excites me. And uh, it, in my uh, work with the uh, Creeping Wave Radio, which is the, the audio drama that I do, of course, we, we try to bring it more into a storyline type format. 
but we i i just like that's the stuff that inspires me is that that the weird oddball stuff that just appears out of nowhere like when you're having a dream and mm -hmm. uh the the fact that you could take a dream and put it into a chapter and that you can just like look into it and experience somebody else's dream and go like wow that was weird here's another one let's play with that <laughs> and i i think that that for me is what's really fun what are you able to pull material from your own dreams yes yeah uh, a lot of uh that that was originally i have these extremely vivid uh nightmares isn't really the word for it because i i find it a lot more pleasant than like going to walmart and taking out the trash and doing the dishes so <laughs> it's much more exciting when I'm being like chased down the road by a giant eyeball or something like that, you know, but um, yeah, it's, it, and so I, the nightmare isn't really the, the word for it, but it's that kind of imagery, that kind of just really disturbing, visceral kind of imagery that uh, I, I dream a lot about. And um, I, I tend to have pretty good recall with it. So I just come into it and kind of put it down and a lot of my illustrations if you go to uh, lostbreadcomic.com you can see like a lot of my illustrations kind of come from that and <laughs> it's uh it's just kind of uh fun and interesting and uh yeah just very unhinged kind of creative style so i don't i don't remember any of my dreams and when i do it's yeah. something really boring like i have a dream about how i'm looking for a pen yeah <laughs> <laughs> oh I looked under the table, I found a pen. That was my dream. That's what I hear from a lot of people is that they, they uh, don't don't have very interesting dreams or that they'll have dreams like that they were on the computer or something like mm -hmm. that. And I'm like, oh, that seems like kind of a waste because you can do that in real life. But, um, you know, it, it's like they, they're not in control of it. It's, that's mm -hmm. just what's coming into them. Um, I find when I'm writing... Uh, like w when I'm getting ready to write down the scripts for Creeping Wave or something like that, or when I'm drawing consistently, the things become way more vivid, may way more weird, way more crazy to the point where I'm like, oh, we have to put that in. We have to go back to the outline and put this in because that was crazy and cool and I like it. And yeah. So I guess I would have to ask you, what are things in your life that are consistent inspirations for you and your writing? I mean, my biggest themes are mm -hmm. so far between two books being the biggest theme is is the tie between religion and mental disorders. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, like I said, Sink was a shaman with schizotypal, and then there's a there's the religion being weaponized uh, in in the faith machine. And I've been outlining two other books, and religion definitely plays a play like plays a part in one of them. Mm -hmm. uh, um, yeah, that would be it, and it's probably because. I don't believe that there is sanity, mm -hmm. you know, like this division between sane and insane. I think yeah. we all are basically bags of chemicals that are processing the inputs and they come out and outputs. And I don't think any of us are, are greater or less than for, for that. Um, just different. And I think possibly I'm always interested. I've always been interested in culture and the big culture, that culture being the way that people, groups of people perceive the world. Yeah, and this is to me. These are just other cultures, mm -hmm. and I just want to, you know, get that perspective and see how the world is different from that angle. That okay. would probably be about it. Um, other than that, just doing my research and, and shoving as many pop culture, uh, deep cut pop culture references into a story as I can. Yes, so <laughs> very cool. I I've noticed that. That's I always think that's kind of fun little Easter eggs that you sneak inside. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, yeah, um, that if, if you uh, pick up Tone's books and you're an astute reader, you'll notice a whole bunch of like little fun trinkets that are scattered mm -hmm. along the way. And uh, yeah, and I'm just just really, really love your writing style. Really excited to have you on the show. Um, for anybody out there who is an aspiring writer, um, what is some advice that you might have to offer them? My advice is. Uh, there's a lot of advice out there and mm -hmm. you got to pick and choose what works for you. Uh, so cast a wide net, read a lot of books on it. If you read some advice and it really rings true, that's probably for you. Um, and you build your toolkit that way. And sometimes you outgrow a tool and you need to get rid of it and you pick up a different tool. Yeah. Um, but don't think that any of that stuff is scripture. Like 
write what you know gets shouted around a lot. Uh, show don't tell gets shouted around a lot. Uh, no adjectives. I think it, no no adverbs was one that gets shouted a lot. I think there's exceptions to all those rules. And you know maybe you can build a style about, around being the exception to all those rules. Yep. Very cool. So um, I I I I'm a little nervous to ask this because I I don't want to. <laughs> ruin anything that you you might be keeping a secret but are there any future projects or works in development that you can tease us with uh so finishing up the role playing game mm -hmm. uh so that's going to be for the fate core system which is uh, kind of like the fate game that we played a little bit more detail to it and hopefully getting that kick started this year so and this will be the first time i kick started something so on the one hand, it's daunting because I haven't really built an audience, and Kickstarters are more successful when you have, you know, a base to pull from. But because it's already for an established rule set, I think there's already an audience out there for that. Like there's 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 generic rule sets that apply to a lot of games, and there's people who are completists, right? So they'll buy every Dungeons and Dragons book and they'll buy every Savage Worlds book. So at least I got that <laughs> to start as a starter, right? Yes. Um, and when that's done, then I've got an outline for two more faith machine, or rather two more project deadline books. Mm. And I want to get that done. This is like my agent, when I had the agent, she wanted to get me to write something else. And I just, my heart wasn't in it. Like this, I really think the psychic spy thing is my thing. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, it, it feeds all my superhero um, itches. Feeds all my itches. It, makes my, <laughs> it mixes all my metaphors. There you go. And, uh, but it's but it also does. I don't have to do the rationalization that I've been doing all through the '90s to make superheroes work. You mm -hmm. know, like you know the post Watchmen, post Dark Knight era. Yeah, everything's got to be realistic. Gritty. Yeah, <laughs> that bothers me so much. Like honestly, <laughs> because it's like because uh, because I love like obviously I love the really bizarre, uh, frenetic kind of things, and there's certain things like uh, kaiju or something like that, like Godzilla. You you can't. Like mm -hmm. give it a real explanation. It's and that's what's fun about it is it's so ridiculous and so mm -hmm. out there. And it's like I get enough real life in real life, and I'm not real partial to it. And... <laughs> not oh, fan. No, it's, it's it, yeah. Well, yeah. yeah the, new, <laughs> the new seasons have not been good. <laughs> no, <laughs> but I just I I, I feel like um, people are always saying things like. We want to see real people, and so and it's like, have, I mean, go outside. You you'll meet real people. <laughs> they're incredibly boring. They're mm -hmm. they're yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, just, I don't know that you. I understand what they're saying. They they're saying like we want people who don't make us feel insecure about ourselves because they're so spectacular and that kind of thing. It's like, well, I I want to see people who are so spectacular because I'm not holding myself in comparison. I'm like, I want to. Be involved in your world. Take me somewhere I can't go in the real world for a little while. So <laughs> yeah. I think, yeah, I think that's why I really am excited about your books. So <laughs> it's it's you, you touched on something that was yeah. a debate for a while. It's like how do you how do writers who write in the present deal with the COVID and the lockdown yeah. and everything like that? And Brad Thor, I think, said it best. It's like we're writing escapism, and this mm -hmm. is what people want to escape from. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. so. Skipping over all that quarantine stuff. Right, right, yeah. So I, I don't really want to read a story about somebody who hasn't showered for six days and who's been sitting on their phone scrolling through Facebook, and it's that's just not what I want to pick up. And yeah, mm -hmm. maybe there's people out there who just like I love the gritty realism. I love when like he liked this guy's comment that was awesome, and it's like no, I'd rather not. <laughs> but yeah. So, so Tone, if people want to get in touch with you within reason, or if they want to uh, find your books, what is the best place that they can scout you out? You know, my name is got a strong SEO value, mm -hmm. so there's not a lot of Tone Malazas out there. No. Uh, obviously, there's links to everything off my website. That's like uses my my hub for all the, the contacts. Uh, uh, Picking up the ghost is only available digital now. There's still okay. plenty of used copies out there, and honestly, I've got used copies in the garage. So if people want to hit me up, I'll I'll sell you one of those. <laughs> um, 
it's available digitally on Amazon and Drive Through Fiction. And then uh, the Faith Machine is honestly available anywhere you buy books. You can just special order it. Yeah. Very cool. So, all right. Thank you so much, Tone. It was awesome. You want to talk about talk you. You're going to be on my show. I'm going to be on your show. Yes. Oh, my gosh. And uh, it is. Are we allowed to give away the theme? Hmm? Oh, okay. <laughs> It's it's William S. Burroughs, Lord of the Flies, which is Lord going to or, or Lord of the Rings. Oh, even better. Yeah. So the Lord of the Flies <laughs> would would offer a lot. <laughs> but um, yeah, Lord of the Rings. This is it's going to be because uh, I, I I guess you you maybe can tell from like how excited I got about Dadaism that I'm I'm a Burroughs <laughs> fan, and uh, <laughs> and uh, I also love Lord of the Rings. Um, yeah, I, I think I knew you had the Burroughs project coming up. So I, I to do. Make yeah. Um, so, so, uh, are, are you going to be submitting the, we're doing a special episode of just for the people listening, uh, of creeping wave. That's going to be uh William S Burroughs themed because his birthday is February 5th. Um, mm -hmm. cause I'm a fan girl and, uh, we're mm -hmm. going to be trying to release an episode where people are going to write pieces inspired by William Burroughs or, it, even you can just submit a sentence, that's fine. Or you can submit up to five pages because I had some people saying like, ah, page and a half, that's not long enough for me. I need more. And I was like, okay, five pages, but we need room for everybody. Mm -hmm. But then conversely, it's like, what if nobody submits? And then I'm just like, oh, I should have let them do the five pages. So I'm like, oh, <laughs> five pages, I can par it down. So, mm -hmm. yeah, so I'm writing my first poem for you. Oh, I'm so excited. <laughs> <laughs> very cool but yeah we're gonna be doing cyclops road uh and tone yeah. is gonna be basically dming this game mm -hmm. and uh we are gonna have anthony silva and azzy uh, mm -hmm. yeah uh yeah she's a car comic book artist who used to live here in san diego now she's up in minnesota okay yeah. very neat so mm -hmm. yeah and um that that is cyclops road if you guys want to check it out that's a podcast that tone runs um, this is going to be my, my second experience doing role-playing with you. Mm -hmm. So it's going to be kind of fun. Uh, the, the first one was uh, I did a very hedonism bot inspired character as he, <laughs> he's my favorite character from Futurama. So who, who happened to be a captain of a ship. So, but, uh, it was neat. It was, it was, uh, so it was a, that, ex that panel was an improv exercise mm -hmm. and nobody, of the ideas pitched from the audience that wasn't really a villain, but you filled in that role nicely. <laughs> Just from being such a self-serving bastard. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> but uh, yeah, so it, it was, it was a lot of fun. Um, and yeah, it, it was very fun, very freeing to be able to just, uh, and, and that's what I like about role playing uh, is I love the getting to take on a character part of it. I don't love the like keeping track of stats and that kind of stuff because I'm used to having the DM do it for me and that kind of thing because I'm lazy. But um, yeah, and it, that that part's always been a struggle for me because it's just not how my brain is geared. But I mean, when in your life do you just get a chance to just go off on some random character in public? I, I guess mm -hmm. you could do it whenever you wanted, really. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, yeah, and it, it's it's a, a safe environment to experiment with new personalities and new worlds, and I think that's what I, I really love about it. So yeah, that's really, what I use it for is to sort of get out of my head a little bit. Yeah, um, absolutely. Yeah. So okay, thank you so much, Tone. So everybody, thank you check for out. Me. We finally made this happen. All right. Everyone check out tomalazo.com and uh, you better grab those books because they're pretty exciting. You will not be disappointed. Thank you very All right. much for that. Thank you. Of course, okay. watch break on. Get those too. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Special thanks to Tone Malazzo for coming on the show. You can check him out at his website, which is tonemalazzo.com. Not a lot of other Tone Malazzos out there, so we're pretty sure that's him. Thank you so much to our legendary announcer, Savage C. Walnar, who makes this all possible with his melodious voice. And melodious, talk about melodious, there's the You Mind theme by Ethan McSell. It's called Demilitarized Zone, and it's fantastic. You can become a Patreon and give us a monthly donation, patreon.com slash lucidnap. Or are you scared of commitment? Then you can go to buymeacoffee.com slash lucidnap for small one-time donations. Hooray! 
You can also go to LostBreadComic.com and buy art and prints and all sorts of crazy crap. You can follow us if you want to keep up with what we're doing. Yeah, that's a good idea. You can just click on all the social media links down below. That's what they're there for because you want to follow us. We want you to follow us. So, hey, you know what? You should check out Creeping Wave Radio. That little intro at the beginning, that's uh, that's kind of tying into Creeping Wave Radio. It's what happens on the U-Mind when the mics go off. It is a scripted audio drama that features some of the greatest San Diego musicians and actors and, well, people from all over the place, actually. We, we got a guy in Minnesota. We got a, a gal in Texas. We got, we just bring in people from all over the place. Whoever's good, they're going to show up on Creeping Wave Radio, so check it out. And thanks for watching or listening or whatever you were doing. If you weren't watching, you should probably watch because there's like a wee little animation at the beginning and you can see Tom Malazzo's beautiful face and it's going to change your life. Thank you to The Gramerica Show. Nikki Benfield and Neil, the lovable Neil, because they're our Patreons, they give us money, and they make this possible. Yes. So, thanks a bunch. The You Mind is brought to you by Lucid Nap Productions in cooperation with this big hairy guy who's got horns and he's my boss and he's not here right now, so I can really say whatever I want about him. So. <laughs> oh. Hello, podcast addicts and curious listeners. Dr. Galvanic's Odd Tales is a narrated podcast with dark, thrilling and mysterious stories. In each episode, Dr. Galvanic's Odd Tales will take you through the mysteries of the Australian outback, lead you into a remote corner of the galaxy, or it will accompany you through a mind-bending nightmare. You can find Dr. Galvanic's Odd Tales on Apple Podcast, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Subscribe to the show so you won't miss another episode. See you out there. This has been a presentation of the Project Entertainment Network.